We are continuing this morning in our sermon series in the book of Ezra, Stirred to Rebuild. I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Ezra chapter 7. We began the chapter last Sunday. We will conclude that chapter this morning as we direct our attention to verses 11 through 28. If you have your Bibles, please uh, turn there. We also have the Pew Bibles if you'd like to use the Pew Bible. And I'd like to invite you to stand now for the reading of God's Word. This is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe, a man learned in matters of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, peace. And now I make a decree that any one of the people of Israel or their priests or Levites in my kingdom who freely offer to go to Jerusalem may go with you. For you are sent by the king and his seven counselors to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of God which is in your hand and also to carry the silver and the gold that the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel whose dwelling is in Jerusalem with all the silver and the gold that you shall find in the whole province of Babylonia. And with the free will offerings of the people and the priests vowed willingly for the house of their God that is in Jerusalem. With this money then you shall with all diligence buy bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and their drink offerings and you shall offer them on the altar of the house of your God that is in Jerusalem. Whatever seems good to you and your brothers to do with the rest of the silver and the gold you may do according to the will of your God. The vessels that have been given you for the service of the house of your God, you shall deliver before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever else is required for the house of your God, which it falls to you to provide, you may provide it out of the king's treasury. And I, Artaxerxes, the king, make a decree to all the treasurers in the province beyond the river, whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, requires of you, let it be done with all diligence." Up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil, and salt without prescribing how much. Whatever is decreed by the God of heaven, let it be done in full for the house of the God of heaven, lest his wrath be against the realm of the king and his sons. We also notify you that it shall not be lawful to impose tribute, custom, or toll on any one of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the doorkeepers, the temple servants, or other servants of this house of God. And you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God that is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people in the province beyond the river, all such as know the law of your God. And those who do not know them you shall teach. Whoever will not obey the law of your God, the law of the king, let judgment be strictly executed on him whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of his goods or for imprisonment. Blessed be the Lord, the God of your fathers. Put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem and who extended to me his steadfast love before the kings and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was on me. And I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. Heavenly Father, we desire to go up, to be gathered together, to go up to the house of our God. And we have come. And we pray, Lord, that you would teach us with all diligence your word. And through your word, we might have a revelation of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in seeing him, we might worship him. And that we might be shaped and formed and fashioned in accord with his image. So as to bring a clarity and a beauty and a glory to this dark and fallen world. So that through the church, Christ might be perceived. Your kingdom not only built but advanced. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. My maternal grandmother was 
100% Italian. She was a full-blooded Italian. Her name was Adrian Rotunda. And Rotunda in Italian means big and fat, which was great. My grandmother used to always say, actually my great-grandmother, who I simply knew as great-grandma Rotunda, used to say with us, to us with great regularity, uh, mangia fatta grossa, eat and get fat. That was, um, that was how we lived, and it shows. My uh, grandmother, Adrian, she ended up marrying... Uh, having been raised in New York City, she ended up marrying a full-blooded German, a gentleman by the name of Robert Zunkley. Both Zunkley and Rotunda couldn't be more uh, pronounced in terms of the ethnicity that they represented. And so there was a combining of the forces. The German forces and the Italian forces came together in the union between Adrian and Robert. But my Grandmother, Adrian never lost uh, her sense of belonging, where she came from. She never lost her Italian roots. She kept faith with a long-standing and time-honored tradition, a practice of preservation and keeping up appearances. Now, this isn't my grandmother. I couldn't find, actually, a a picture, at least a digital picture of my grandmother uh, that I could share with you this morning. But I found this woman on the Internet, and she is a faithful representation of who my grandmother was uh, back in the 1950s. As she, along with my grandmother, did the work of preservation and keeping up appearances. And they did that by putting plastic on the furniture. You'll see the plastic there that's on the sofa to the left, and the woman sitting on the sofa is sitting on a piece of plastic. My grandmother, when she was raised in New York City, lived in a two-story apartment with a very large Italian family, and their custom, in fact the law of that house was all of the living happened downstairs in the lower part of the apartment and the upper part of the apartment was covered in plastic and you only made access to that part of the apartment when you had visitors who came in and you spent a little bit of time there in these curated rooms. I remember growing up when my grandmother moved from uh, New York, actually they spent... uh, their early uh, married life in Long Island, New York, and then later moved to Pittsburgh just about the time that my mother and father got married. And growing up as a kid, we would go and visit my grandparents in the North Hills, and we would always go and uh, visit the curated rooms. In fact, my father used to say, we're going to the museum because she had what we called affectionately, we never said this to her face, but we said that she had the rope rooms, those red velvet ropes that keep you out, the dining room and the living room of my grandmother's house was totally off limits to us as grandkids. And the sofa was indeed covered in plastic. And we could kind of look through the doorway and and observe what was going on there, but we never spent any time there. I never sat on the couch and we never ate a meal in the dining room. We always ate in the kitchen. Many years ago, my mother inherited my grandmother's dining room suite. My grandmother died suddenly when I was 13 and unexpectedly. And after that, uh, my mother inherited the, the dining room suite and we brought it into our home and uh, at that time, we, we were able to afford a, a slightly larger house, and uh, we had a dining room, and the tradition continued. It went into the dining room. We never used it. We never sat there. We never ate at the dining room table. All of our eating, all of our uh, living was done in the kitchen. 
Then about 10 years ago, my mother asked me if I was interested in all in taking possession of the dining room suite. And I was shocked and surprised that she would even offer it to me. We had just moved into a small home in uh, Bethel Park that had a dining room. It had also a small kitchen. There was nowhere to eat in the kitchen, really. Uh, We did have a small little table where the kids could eat, but the family couldn't eat in the kitchen. So I said to my mother, we would be happy to take the dining room furniture. In fact, we could use it. But I want you to know that we will actually use the furniture. And my mother took a step back. I have to be careful. I've learned that my mom is now watching these sermons online. So, Mom, I love you. Uh, But this is too good of a story not to use. My mother actually, she she hesitated. You're going to use the furniture? I said, Mom, we're going to eat at the table. The kids are going to do their homework at the table. We're going to live in our dining room. And she took a leap of faith and let us have the furniture, and we used it for about 10 years. And two years ago, we decided to get rid of the furniture, and I wasn't quite sure how my mom was going to react when I told her that we were going to get rid of it. Uh, we were, uh, it, it ended up that my sister ended up taking the furniture, but I had to let my mom know that this was happening. And so I called her up with some fear and trepidation and said, Mom, I'm getting rid of the furniture. I'm giving it to Rachel, my sister. And, you know, I, you, she, you know, her and her kids are wild animals. Who knows what's going to happen? I said, but you know what, Mom? It's actually not that good a furniture. I had come to learn what real furniture was, and, and we were getting an opportunity to upgrade to actual real furniture. And I realized that this was really the furniture that my grandmother bought was all for show. It was compressed wood with veneer, and it couldn't really hold up to living. And I said, Mom, it's not really good furniture. And she said, yeah, yeah, I know. (laughs) All these years of preserving cardboard. I wanted to use the furniture, not preserve it. Unfortunately, the furniture was not capable of withstanding our use. It was not capable of being deeply lived into. A well-made piece of furniture will take in, in fact, invite the small scratches, the blemishes, the marks that happen when your child is pressing too hard with their pencil through the paper and into the wood. It begins to take in the story of your life. And when you pass on a piece of heirloom furniture, you're not just passing on the furniture, you're passing on those stories, you're passing on those scratches, those imperfections, those dents, and they remind you of the, the life that you, that you had, the, the, the life that you are receiving that comes with the generations. This furniture was incapable of keeping all that, and so I wanted to get different furniture. I wanted to use the furniture because I'm not nostalgic. At least that's one of the things I've learned about myself. I'm not particularly nostalgic. I do think, however, I'm traditional. And I want to make a distinction for you this morning between nostalgia and tradition. Nostalgia, I will suggest, is a feeling that is excessively prone to preserving the past a sentimental longing or inordinate affection for the past. And I've come to learn that I'm not sentimental, though my grandmother was sentimental. My mother is sentimental. I've also learned that my kids are sentimental, particularly my son, who gets it from both sides of the family. My father-in-law is tremendously sentimental. There isn't a a piece of rusted out equipment that he doesn't have some strong affection for that has to be kept. And I learned that my my son uh, got it from both sides of the family when he started keeping rocks and putting it on his shelf because they reminded him of things that happened When he was outside, strong affection for the past, preserving the past. That's not something that's 
natural to me. And there's a, a value to a certain measure of nostalgia. But I trend towards more towards tradition. Handing down and grateful reception of established patterns of thoughts and behaviors. I'm interested in a way of life a way of being. I'm interested in the story that the scratch and the imperfection in the table has to tell more than I am in the table itself. Nostalgia lives in the past. That's okay to a certain degree, but tradition lives with the past. It invites the past into the future. It invites the past with you. Nostalgia seeks to preserve the way things were. We'll oftentimes try to mummify things in order that it might not be lost. But tradition promotes the way things should be. It receives that way of life and seeks to have it established and promoted to live in a way that is good and healthy and true. Nostalgia lays claim to the past. We've got to hold on to that thing back there. We don't want it to be lost. But tradition lays claim to people and says, You're a part of this thing. It's being passed on to you, it's being entrusted to you, and you are now a, a recipient of something wonderful and good. In fact, you've become a steward of it, to hold fast to it and to live by it. Nostalgia oftentimes looks back. It's important to look back, but not too much. As Jesus warned, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and continues to look back, only and always look back, is not fit for the kingdom of God, he says. The tradition looks forward. How can I take the best of what was once was, what was in the past, and bring it forward? Nostalgia is manageable. How do we manage these things? How do we preserve these things? How do we set up the ropes so that nobody goes in and does unnecessary damage to that which we're trying to preserve? But tradition is meaningful. It brings meaning to our lives. We are recipients of all of that meaning, all of that purpose. It comes to us in the form of a tradition. Rick and I used to talk a lot about the state of the church in my early years when I was here and growing in my relationship with Rick as a mentor and being trained by him. We used to talk about the state of the PCUSA, our denomination that we are a part of, and we used to talk about the state of the American church, and we talked about what we call dead orthodoxy, a preservation of a set of beliefs that was dead, had no life to it, had no way of promoting something into the future. And oftentimes it has been suggested that dead orthodoxy is a result of tradition, and that may be to a certain extent if it's not rightly used, but I would say that dead orthodoxy is a result of lifeless nostalgia. Dead orthodoxy would be avoided if it were infused with a living tradition. I think that's what Ezra is trying to get to in our text for this morning. Chapter 7, verses 11 through 28. Ezra is helping to craft a letter that is going to be read in the presence of the people who are gathering in Jerusalem. And Ezra is trying to promote and trying to offer, trying to pass down a living tradition. And why does he want to do that? Because it is vitally important. In fact, there is... Oh, this just got screwed up on me. There is no kingdom if it is not animated by a living tradition. Israel is being formed. They're being brought up out of Babylonian captivity... And Zerubbabel 
and Jeshua have done the work of building the temple. Nehemiah has done the work of building the wall. And now Ezra is coming and he is doing the work of building the people. In order for them to be built and in order for them to be strong, they must receive something that precedes them that will give them the strength. There is no kingdom and there is no keeping of the kingdom if it is not animated and brought to life by a living tradition. And you'll notice here that I have decided to capitalize the word tradition. Capital T, tradition. It is capitalized because it is authorized. There is a difference between capital T, tradition, and lowercase t, tradition. Little t, tradition, is the traditions of men. What Jesus warned against. Be careful, he said. Be careful of the tradition of men. Be careful of the tradition of the Pharisees. But when Jesus said that, he wasn't saying avoid tradition altogether. Avoid lowercase t tradition. But embrace. Live. Be animated by capital T tradition because it has been authorized and it has been authorized by God capital T tradition if it is capital T tradition is capital T tradition because it has been animated and authorized by almighty God and God expects his people to build according to capital T tradition Build according to the tradition. Build a kingdom filled with a holy people who worship the Lord, remain faithful to His Word, and stay on mission. This is the tradition. This is what was established by God authorized by God from the very beginning. This is the inheritance. This is the legacy. This is the living tradition that is given to Adam all the way back in the garden. God gives him a wife, Eve, and he says, fill the earth, subdue it, create a kingdom, and fill it with holy people who worship me and remain faithful to my commandments. Eat of the tree of life, not of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And do the work that I've called you to in maintaining the garden. This is the tradition, and this tradition is passed on, even though it seemed like it was lost and could have been lost, and if not by grace, would have been lost. It was passed on to Abraham, and God called him. From his father's tent. He said, I'm going to send you to a land that you know not of. And I want you to build a kingdom filled with the holy people who worship the Lord and remain faithful to his word and stay on mission. And this tradition is passed on from father to son, father to son, father to son, all through the patriarchs. It's passed on even though it looked like it was getting lost. It was passed on to the people of God when God raised up Moses and said, I want you to go and get a people. I want you to set them free and I want you to bring them to the promised land and I want you to bestow upon them a rich and wonderful and powerful tradition of being a holy people who worship the Lord, remain obedient to my commandments and stay on mission, bring the kingdom of God near. This tradition is passed on to David and to his son Solomon. And it seemed like maybe it was lost when Israel went into exile, but God raised up Ezra and said, I want you to send the people into Jerusalem and I'm going to send you, Ezra, to share with them the tradition. I want them to build according to the tradition. In our text for today, we read a letter by Artaxerxes. 
God is again stirring the heart of the king. Remember when God stirred the heart of Cyrus to send Zerubbabel, to send Yeshua the high priest in order to build the temple. And God is now stirring the heart of the king again to send Ezra and to go, yes, with gold, yes, with silver, but with something even more precious, the tradition. This letter was probably written with input from Ezra, with influence by Ezra. And Artaxerxes, because he's been stirred, wants to put this letter into Ezra's hand because it will serve in a particular way. It serves as a firman. A firman is a warrant to conduct business, authorizing the bearer to carry out business in the king's name. So Ezra goes with a letter in hand, a firman, a warrant to build according to the tradition. And the letter itself outlines the tradition. It outlines the commandments of the Lord. It outlines the statutes for Israel. The letter here in Ezra chapter 7 verses 11 through 28 is a summary of of the law, a summary of the Torah. It's what we would call today a rule of life, or what I am calling this morning the tradition. It is a rule of life for the remnant of God. It is the most important things to know in order that you might occupy the land, in order that you might keep the land. Here are all the things that have come before you that you must receive and be stewards of. And so I want to invite you to take your Bibles and to open up again to Ezra chapter 7 because we're going to be looking at a number of the verses quickly as we outline the tradition, the rule of life for remnants. It begins in verse 12. The whole thing, the whole tradition is predicated on grace. The fact that a Persian king would write such a letter is evidence of grace. The whole tradition and the whole kingdom life is predicated upon grace. That God would call. That he would graciously call his people out of Babylonian captivity that he would graciously call his people out of Egyptian slavery, that he would graciously call his people out of darkness and death after they ate from the tree, all begins with grace. In verse 13, the tradition, the rule of life for remnants includes freedom, glorious freedom, as Artaxerxes says, I declare that anyone, anyone may go to Jerusalem. You are free from Persian rule and law. You are free and given freedom from Persian authority. You are free to go to Jerusalem and live not according to Persian law, but according to the law of Yahweh. The tradition includes and requires freedom. The tradition includes and requires the word. You are sent, Ezra, to make inquiries about a life in Jerusalem according to the law of God. That's what's written in verse 14. The word which authorizes and outlines the tradition. It gives in detail what I am describing to you in summary. Go and make diligent inquiry of the law. Seek to understand it. Seek to live it. Seek to embody it as the great tradition. It is the rule of your life as the people of God. Know it. Live by it. The rule of life for remnants includes stewardship. Carry the silver, Artaxerxes says. Carry the gold. Carry all that has been freely offered to God. The economy of God is built on a love for God, a love for neighbor, a love for worship, and a generosity from heaven. God is saying, I am entrusting riches to you. That's part of the tradition. 
The gold is mine. The silver is mine. I am giving it to you. Steward it well and use it for worship. With this money, you shall buy sacrificial, uh, sacrificial offerings and worship the Lord. This is the purpose for which you are going. And I am going to supply you with all that you need. Go into the land, inhabit the land, and worship the Lord. The rule of life for remnants includes diligence. The tradition requires careful consideration, focus, hard work, privileging the kingdom. I was talking with one of the leaders in our church a little while back, and he was going to talk to another man in the church who was being strengthened in his discipleship, being formed in Christ. And he asked me, what's the one thing that you would want me to tell this man? And I said, without hesitation, tell him to privilege the church. Privilege the church. It's part of the tradition with all diligence to privilege the kingdom, to be focused, to work hard for it. Whatever is decreed by God being done in full, this is discipleship. This is life in the kingdom. This is the disciplined life. This is the tradition. Diligence in our life. Order. Verse 25. Artaxerxes writes, According to the wisdom of God, appoint judges and establish justice. There's a particular way of living. I want you to live according to it. I want my justice, God says, to be understood and realized in, in my land and in my kingdom. This is a living tradition and it requires the right ordering of things. Teach one another. Verse 25, those, those who do not know the law, you shall teach. You shall pass on the tradition. You shall pass on the inheritance. You shall give it to your sons and your daughters as if it were life itself. Teach them. And if they will not obey, and if they will not listen... Then discipline them. Whoever will not obey will be disciplined, and those who reject the tradition will not inherit the kingdom. The tradition includes beauty. Make it beautiful, God says. My kingdom is beautiful. Beautify the house of the Lord. Adorn the kingdom with splendor and beauty. Let the world see how beautiful this tradition is and love. Bless the Lord who extends his steadfast love to his people. That he would give us such an inheritance. He loves us so much that he would bless us with this tradition. That he would call us to build according to the tradition in order that we might be a people. Worship the Lord, remain faithful to His Word, and stay on mission. And the tradition requires leadership in order to be built, in order to be maintained. Not just any kind of leadership, but courageous leadership. Ezra took courage. And he courageously gathered leading men to join with him in the building. Ezra said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm leaving Persia. I'm going to build according to the tradition. It's not going to be easy, but who's willing to come with me? I'm going to stand for God. I'm going to put my shoulder to the plow. I'm going to work. Who will come? Who is stirred? Who will build with me? The tradition requires courageous leadership. There is no kingdom if it is not animated by a living tradition. This was true of Ezra. This was true of Jesus. See, Jesus is a builder. And he is building a kingdom. He's building in accord with tradition. He's been stirred to build and Jesus is given a firman, a warrant by God the Father. And he shares that warrant in Luke chapter 4. 
Jesus declares that the kingdom is here. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them today, Today it's built. Today I have come. This has been fulfilled in your hearing. Come with a warrant, with a firman. And here's an even more condensed summary of what it sounds like, of what it looks like. I have come to set you free in order that you might live to God. But in verse 22, the people get nostalgic. They say, Isn't this Joseph's son? We remember him. We know who he is. Oh, that sweet little boy, Jesus. I've heard. I've heard that he's done miracles in Capernaum. And now he's here. And maybe he'll perform miracles among us. And he will preserve our way of life. Isn't it great that he has come? Isn't it great that Jesus has come back home? Isn't it great that that Jesus has come to Nazareth? He can curate our lives. He can preserve our lives. Jesus says, no. I'm inviting you into a way of life into a tradition, into a life under God. All you want me to do is preserve things for you, to preserve a past. The prophet is never accepted in his hometown. They got angry with him. They sought violence after him. They wanted to throw him over a cliff. Jesus is interested not in preserving the past, but in offering a gospel tradition handing down a way of life, handing down an inheritance, a living tradition, a kingdom, a pattern of thought and behavior that can only be found in him and lived through him. And he sets forth that gospel tradition for us, not in Luke chapter 4, but very close after, just one chapter later in Luke chapter 5, he shows us the gospel tradition. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up to the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles and into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. Man. No name is offered here. Man. Humanity. Autumn kind. I am offering you a living tradition. I am offering you hope. I am offering you freedom. Your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees, they don't recognize the pattern. They don't recognize the tradition. They reject the tradition. They're far too nostalgic for that. How can he forgive sins? Who is this man? Who does he think he is? But not just the Pharisees, not just the scribes. Consider for a moment the man himself. What must have he been thinking He must have been thinking, sins? They just ripped a hole in the roof and brought me down. I'm in a bed, paralyzed, and you're talking about sins. Preserve my life. I can't walk. What are you doing? I remember the past. I remember the legs of my youth. Heal my body. Why won't you do that? 
I remember life before the sickness. I remember life before the tragedy. I remember life before this financial ruin. I remember life before I lost my job. I remember life before COVID-19. Why won't you preserve it, Lord? Why won't you bring that back? Maybe we're thinking, I'm enjoying life now. It's not so bad. Don't let anything change. Don't upset the apple cart. Just preserve it. Just encase it in plastic and don't let it ever change. But Jesus said, your freedom can only be found in me. Not in your legs. So when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your heart what is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority, that he's been authorized, that he brings with him the authorized tradition, life in the kingdom. He's been authorized on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. By grace, Not that this man deserved it, but it is a gospel tradition. And immediately he rose up before them. He picked up what he had been lying on and he went home walking and leaping and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God. Why is he walking? Why is he leaping? Why is he praising God? It's not because of the legs. Because of life, a living tradition deposited in his life, he'll never be the same again. So a few things to remember as we bring our time together to a close. The first is this. You can either have a curated life lived on your terms, or a consequential life lived on Christ's terms. Jesus is inviting us into a life. Life that is capitalized. A capital T tradition. A living way. A way of being a way of living, for Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the tradition. I am the one that animates your life. I am the one who sets your course. Come and follow me. And we can either have a curated life, put together in particular ways, snapshot and put on Facebook for all the world to see, or we can have a consequential life is ordered for us by God. And true freedom requires some rules. Freedom is not the absence of constraint in order that we might do just whatever it is that we want to do. Freedom is being released into the fullness of life through Christ. So Jesus offers us a tradition, a living tradition, a rule of life in order that we might truly be free. And then finally, building with tradition is a stewardship responsibility. We must recognize the value of this tradition. We must see it for what it is. The Torah was life. Just like the tree was life. And we couldn't keep the commandment that told us to eat from the tree. And we couldn't keep the commandment that was expressed in the Torah. But there was one who did. And his name is Jesus. And he fulfills it all for us. And we must receive life through him. We must build according to that tradition to recognize the value of the tradition, to receive the tradition with great joy. 
and to steward the tradition, to build according to the tradition. We are building. We are building here at Beverly Heights. And there's only one way to build. To build in accord with the one who is the tradition. The embodiment of the tradition. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you today. And we desire to be good stewards. The beginning of stewardship always requires humble recognition. So Lord, humble us. Help us to know of our great need and of your love for us and your grace toward us. That even though we are in need, even though we are broken, even though we are sickly, even though our legs don't work, you come to us by grace and you tell us what our need is. Man, your sins are forgiven you. Help us, Lord, not to be tempted by the desire for nostalgia to only preserve, but to embrace the life that you have called us to to embrace the grace that is being offered to us, to embrace the tradition, to build a life with it in order that your kingdom might be seen, in order that your kingdom might come and your will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. 